Coming up on Jamaica Magazine. Pre-planning is necessary for recovery and resilience. And as we focus on the 2019 Atlantic hurricane season, the call has been made. Jamaicans should be prepared. Plus... Our total beneficiary count to include JADEP and NHF is about 818,000 persons. The National Health Fund, providing coverage for 17 illnesses. Hello, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Stick around for the details. Motorists, when driving on the road, here are some simple reminders. Look out for and extend courtesy to all road users. Give plenty of room to pedestrians, especially in wet weather. Drive slowly. No bother wet them up. Slow down when approaching a pedestrian crossing or school and always be prepared to stop. Remember, a school zone is a 30 kilometer zone. Cut your speed. Drivers of large and slow moving vehicles should always keep in the far left hand of a dual carriageway. Keep it simple. Drive left and pass right. These are just simple reminders of your road duties. Drive safely. Good day, I'm Theodore Henry, and this is your JIS News for Thursday, September 19. Jamaica has completed its sixth and final review under the precautionary standby arrangement with the International Monetary Fund, IMF. The review was conducted between September 9 and 19 and will now go to the IMF Executive Board for final approval, making a total of $1.63 billion US dollars accessible to the country. We have worked with transparency. We have worked diligently to ensure that we meet all the targets that we have set for ourselves. And this is a major achievement in our political economy and in our development generally. It was a program that tested our own resolve to be true to our own real economic interests. During a press briefing at his office Wednesday, the Prime Minister expressed confidence that with the IMF now out of the room, government can maintain the fiscal discipline that the country has committed to over the last 10 years. IMF Director for the Western Hemisphere Department, Dr. Alejandro Werner, agreed. We are convinced that all these policies will support private sector development and increase investment opportunities in Jamaica that will lead to increased employment, growth, and the continued reduction of poverty in the next five years. Jamaica's precautionary standby arrangement with the IMF started in 2016, replacing a previous four-year extended fund facility. The current program is scheduled to officially end on November 8. But the country will continue to benefit from technical assistance and the IMF's Jamaica office will be maintained for an additional two years. Twelve firearms have been recovered in the St. Andrews South Police Division since the implementation of a state of emergency on July 7. Prime Minister Andrew Holness made the disclosure during Tuesday's sitting of Parliament. He said there were other notable successes from the state of emergency. Murders in St. Andrews South Division have reduced by 73% from 48 murders to 13 murders over the period 7th of July 2019 to the 11th of September 2019, 67 days since the declaration of the SOE when compared to the previous 67 days. Shootings in the St. Andrews South Police Division have also reduced, reduced by 61%, making the similar comparison. The state of emergency in St. Andrews South will expire on October 5. In the meantime, opening hours are being extended for businesses operating in St. Catherine and Clarendon, which are now under a state of public emergency. For the first 14 days after the security measure was declared on September 5, businesses in the parishes were ordered closed by 9 p.m. But National Security Minister Dr. Horace Chang says that after consultation with the security forces and the business community, the times will be lengthened. We have agreed to look at the hours going into it. 
have in fact drafted some hours to open the debate, but we are looking at moving the hours from 8 to 10 and in some cases to 11 o'clock. A similar adjustment for business operating hours in Westmoreland, Hanover and St. James was carried out on August 25. Closing time for establishments in those parishes are now between 10 p.m. and midnight. The government is, Mr. Speaker, faced with a balancing act. So we, we agree we have, to get, we have to get it right. But in this balancing act, there is one thing that we are clear on. The right to life supersedes every other right. There is, there is no balancing saving one life with rent, loss of revenue. There is no balance there. You can't equate the two. Jamaica's bunkering industry is now ready to supply ships with LNG fuel following New Fortress's investment in the industry. Minister of Transport and Mining Robert Montague says Jamaica is moving to become the regional leader in bunkering in the Western Hemisphere. We are open for business. Bunkering creates some 900 direct high paying jobs in Jamaica and approximately 3,000 indirect jobs. So it is vital to our economy. We are projecting to get 10% of the ships that pass through the Panama Canal. The minister was speaking recently at the opening ceremony for the second International Bunker Industry Association Caribbean Bunker Conference. The National Minimum Wage Commission wants engagement from the wider public as it seeks consultation on the minimum wage. The commission is hosting a series of consultations in collaboration with the Ministry of Labor and Social Security under the theme, Engaging, Listening and Advising. They began in Montego Bay on September 12 and continue with engagements in Portland on September 24. The team will also seek the input of employees and employers in Manchester, St. Anne and Kingston. We believe, especially when it comes to persons who are at the bottom tier, to ask them to make presentation um, and documentation with respect to how they see the minimum wage. It is our experience that we don't see much of that. And finally, scores of residents in Somerton St. James and its environs benefited last week from free dental services. The five-day engagement was held at the Somerton All Age School, led by a team of 45 professional and student dental care volunteers from the United States of America, Canada, and the Caribbean. They are part of Great Shape Inc.'s 1,000 Smiles project, which operates a free dental clinic in Jamaica each year in collaboration with the Sandals Foundation. Great Shapes has been going around for 16 years in Jamaica, and uh, we are happy to help the people of Jamaica. Along with cleaning, filling, and extracting um, teeth, they also go into nearby schools and they educate children, tell them how to practice proper oral hygiene, and they also leave them with resources that will help them in their day-to-day -day dental care. So it's a great partnership. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Theodore Henry. Thanks for watching. Protect yourself from the flu virus. Visit your nearest health center or doctor to get the flu vaccine. Cover your mouth and nose when coughing and sneezing. Wash your hands regularly with soap and water or by using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Avoid the spread of germs by not touching your eyes, mouth, or nose. And be sure to regularly disinfect surfaces and objects that are used often. Remember, your health is your responsibility. Did you know that the National Health Fund provides coverage for 17 illnesses? To know how you can benefit and apply for a card, watch this. When you hear the name National Health Fund, you think of a card that allows certain individuals to get free medication or medication at a reduced cost. But there is more to the agency as it also supports the development of our national health care system. Right, the National Health Fund was set up some 15 years ago 
to provide support to healthcare in Jamaica. And at the time, it was thought that the agency would cover some key illnesses in terms of the medication aspect of care. And I think we started with 13 chronic conditions in terms of coverage. And it really provides support to persons, Jamaicans specifically, who have those chronic conditions. We also provide support to public institutions in terms of support for capital projects, supporting health promotion programs, and just generally providing support in great areas of need in healthcare right. in Jamaica. Yes, and the direct benefits to, to, to us Jamaicans. Um, who benefits? How can they apply? Let us talk about that. Right. Well, the NHF and JADEP cards are our major platforms for offering health servicing to beneficiaries. For the NHF card, once you're diagnosed with any of the chronic illnesses listed, and we now cover 17 conditions, I think we recently added two sickle cell in 2015 and lupus um, a few months ago. Once you're diagnosed with any of those conditions, we have our application form. Your doctor verifies you have the condition. You then come into any one of our offices and you get your card within 15 to 30 minutes. Initially, the benefit was mainly offered through our Kingston office. But we have listened to our stakeholders and we now have access to the NHF card on a same day basis in every single parish in Jamaica. For the JADEP card, it's a card for persons 60 years and above. So once you get to 60 and you are diagnosed with any of the chronic illnesses covered, then you can also get the JADEP benefits. All right, so the JADEP card is for 60 years, person 60 years and over, but yes. NHF is for any age. Any Jamaican, regardless of your economic situation, regardless of your age, once you have that chronic illness, then you can qualify, then you qualify for the NHF benefit. Right, about how many persons do we have benefiting now from these two, two initiatives? Right, our total beneficiary count to include JADEP and NHF is about 818,000 persons who are enrolled on these programs, 818,000 right. right. Jamaicans. Right. Um, can you speak specifically to the illnesses that are covered? Right. I mentioned earlier we cover right. 17 yes, illnesses. Yes, yes. And this is based on the illnesses that most Jamaicans would be affected by. So it includes asthma, arthritis, diabetes, hypertension, and other chronic illnesses, lupus. Um, we also cover breast cancer in terms of the drugs, prostate cancer and a number of other illnesses. Right. So in terms of the cancer, um, you do the drugs, but do you do some of the treatments like chemotherapy or radiotherapy? No, we, we only do the drugs. drugs. We actually provide a larger subsidy yes. for those drugs because of the high cost of cancer care. So we provide drugs through our card programs um, for breast cancer and right. prostate cancer. Tell us about the costs as it relates to both cards, the different payment right. cards. Well, for the JADEP card, the drugs are free of cost, except that beneficiaries contribute to the dispensing fee, which is $40 per item, up to a maximum of $240. So no beneficiary will pay more than $240. For the NHF card, it is a different arrangement where we pay a subsidy depending on the illness. It ranges between 40 up to about 70%. We provide a greater coverage for conditions like breast cancer and prostate cancer, where the cost of those drugs tend to be a lot more. And the, the beneficiaries will then co-pay. Yes. And in some cases, they have both the NHF card and the health insurance card which leads to a lower copy, which yes. allows greater access. Right. So I have a, a health insurance with a private company, and I have the NHF card. Right. I can use them together. Right. Thank you so very much yes. for sharing with us on the NHF in this week's edition. My Get pleasure. The My pleasure.
It's time to understand more about the protected area of the cockpit country, its boundaries and water resources. Hello and welcome to OPM Connect, the program that helps you to understand the plans and programs of the government. I'm Naomi Francis. Today we talk the cockpit country. What informs the boundaries? What are the issues and how will the government address those issues? We're pleased to be joined today by Senator Robert Morgan, the Parliamentary Secretary at the Office of the Prime Minister. Marilyn Headley, the CEO and Conservator of Forests, and Mr. Peter Clark, the Managing Director of the Water Resources Authority. A very uh, strong panel here to talk about the cockpit country. Let me start off with the Conservator of Forests and help us understand what is the cockpit country and what informs the boundaries. Good afternoon, Naomi, and your listeners and watchers. The cockpit country is an area that we identified, and we started off the identification with the geomorphological features. So if you look at the map, you will see the area that is karst limestone. That was the first decision made once we identified that this boundary will cover the cockpit country. From then we moved on to say what areas of that will be protected. And with that, the southeastern end, you will see, is degraded cars. So we eliminated that and decided that we would do the protection for the areas above that and covering everything else and then add some more forests, some closed broadleaf forests. So if you look now on the map, you will see the map that shows you the boundary that the area that will be protected. That area will include all of the karst limestone except the part in the southeast that goes to Christiana. It then adds the closed broadleaf forest to the east, which is the Litchfield Matison Run area, and some closed broadleaf forest to the west, which is a five and ranking area. And then now that moves on to give you the cockpit country boundary, which encompasses initially 74,000 plus hectares, but now as we do the ground shooting, we are up to 76,000 plus hectares. We are finding that there are other areas that we are including just to accommodate the line in a navigable way. Mm. And that's what we call the ground truthing process. That is called ground truthing. And then after we've done that now, and it is then verified by the National Land Agency, we put it in the permanent markers. Mm. And once we have the permanent markers in, it tells you where the boundary will be. Fantastic. Sounds like an involved process and, and clearly a process that would not just have emerged overnight. So let me go to Senator Morgan because it would have been a process that would have uh, taken some time to evolve. Can you tell us about that process? With various petitions that were launched, discussions accelerated within the government and all the stakeholders, the Water Resources Authority, the Bauxite Institute, the Forestry Department, the National Environmental Protection Agency, including um, the environmentalists, business people, young people, representatives on the Partnership Council, which is basically the consultative framework within the government, sat down for many months to discuss and look at the various studies that have been done by Dale Weber, by Paris Leoie over the years to determine what is the best approach to protect the area that is the cockpit country. At the end of the discussions, looking at all the geological implications, all the ecological and hydrological resources that are there that are important to the country, a determination was made that the proposed cockpit country protected area would encompass 74,000 thereabout hectares of land, which is about 7% of the entire Jamaica. Interestingly, the cockpit country is very rich some areas of it is rich in bauxite. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we had to do when the proposed protected area was being determined was that there was already a, a sp special mining license that exists that encompassed areas that were to be protected. We had to cut that in half, basically. So some of that area is now in, in the, the protected right. cockpit country So there area. were licenses that were signed before our government a long time ago that encompassed areas that are currently in the protected area, that the government had to make a decision to take away a lot of those resources from the bauxite company to protect it. Because even though, as a government, we recognize that mining is very important economically, 
we still consider that protecting the water resources, the ecological resources, mm -hmm. the flora and fauna is actually more important. It's example. interesting you mentioned the ecological uh, issues because we have Mr. Clark here who will talk a little bit too about the geomorphology that would have informed those issues that would have informed the boundary situation as well. If you could, Mr. Clark, help us from the Water Resources Authority. Lots of people say there are aquifers in the area. The, the cockpit country, Miss Headley, as you would, would have said, covers five parishes, yes. very broad area. Mm -hmm. So in terms of looking at the water channels, Help us understand that. Well, the cockpit country provides roughly 38 to 40 percent of Jamaica's water resources that we have been able to exploit, surface water resources. So we have roughly 13 rivers that emanate from the cockpit country. All of, the, all of them, I would say, are all important rivers. Separate and apart from the rivers, there are identified springs and streams. Um, I would say about 19 springs. And another hydrological feature would be the caves and sinkholes. These caves and sinkholes are what are, are part of the introductory conduit system to bring the water from being rainfall, that is now has become surface water, to eventually be feeding these rivers. Mm -hmm. So it is recognized that the caves and the sinkholes are important hydrological features as well. The cockpit country protected area in, its en in, in encompassing all of these, now protects these headwaters and source waters because some of these rivers actually, in response to, to the matter of the geomorphology, some of these yes. rivers sink and then rise again, mm. sometimes within the same cockpit country protected area and then sometimes outside of the cockpit country protected area. So having protected them at their source, it means that at the end of the day, we have, we have we have protected these, I would say, 13 major rivers within, yes. within um, the center to the west of Jamaica. Let me ask you a very straight up question, which is part of uh, some of the issues that are being raised by, by persons within the society. Does mining affect the aquifers in the area, any at all? Well, we have no evidence that mining affects the, affects the water resources. The, 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 the question of aquifers is a little bit, it, it, you're, we're getting into a little bit deeper geology you now. The, the, water, the water sources and the water movement within the cockpit country is not like how you'd have the aquifers on the South Clarendon Plains, for instance. Right. Because this limestone, we have a lot more conduit piping type of flow. Okay? And this is why rivers will rise and sink, because the, the, the cavernous nature of, of, the, of the limestone lends itself to that. So. A lot of the water, the, I will admit that there will be, I will say that there will be sections where there will be pools of water, for instance, but it's not necessarily, um, you know, in underground caverns, but it's not necessarily that you have aquifers that you'll be tapping into to, to for instance, drill into. Mm -hmm. However, the, the importance is recognized not necessarily from a drilling or, or, an, or a water abstraction stage, but the importance of this water as it now flows through the, the conduits to now become the rivers. Thank you so much, <laughs> Senator Robert Morgan, Ms. Marilyn Headley, and Mr. Peter Clark from Water Resources Authority. Really a very, very enlightening discussion. We thank you on social media for joining us. Join us again next time for another edition of OPM Connect. Yo, 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 this is to reducing the impact of disasters occurring in Jamaica. We're ever ready to assist you before, during, and after a disaster. But everybody have a role to play, so make we work together and follow the plan. Whether rich or poor or where you come from, hurricanes affect everyone. So be prepared. Prevention is better than cure. Be prepared. Listen to AdBAM. A message from the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency. Emergency management. As the country stands ready to respond to a possible hit from a hurricane this season, Prime Minister Andrew Holness is urging persons in flood-prone areas to finalize their evacuation plans. He also calls on members of Parliament to formulate disaster plans for their constituencies. Jamaica should be prepared, uh, and I'm saying this bearing in mind what has happened to the Bahamas. Jamaicans should be prepared. 
And this means stocking up on the supplies that you would need in the event of a, of a storm, your candles, your batteries, your canned food, your water supply, warm clothing. Also, Mr. Speaker, I want to take the opportunity to say to persons who live in low-lying areas or areas that have in the past been flood prone or have been affected in times of hurricanes, that whilst your property is important, I would think that your life is more important than your property. And so it is wise now we are in the hurricane season to start putting together your alternative plants. Make contact with those relatives that you have in safer areas or friends that you have in the event that you have to evacuate. Plan out your routes, your mode of transportation if the worst should happen. Mr. Speaker, we have already started as a government to put in place our response plans. We, we always have plans in place. The ADPEM and all the agencies that are involved in first response in the event of a hurricane, we always have these plans in place. We are meeting constantly. But given what has happened in 2017, when we experienced two Category 5 hurricanes that wiped out entire countries, and then what has happened now? I believe we have to intensify our planning. And I have always held the view that when we were threatened by Hurricane Matthew, that it is important that the parliament is mobilized. And so I'm urging MPs to start thinking in this way, looking in your constituency to see the communities that may be at risk, start to make contact with them so that they are prepared to move if they have to move. Start the conversation about evacuation and how you will secure those areas that are evacuated. All of those pre-planning is necessary for recovery and resilience. As we close today's show, we ask that you stay connected via our website, gis.gov.jm. And while you're online, send your feedback to Jamaica Magazine at gis.gov.jm or via tweet at JIS News. On behalf of the entire production crew, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Do take care. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.